Thank you very much. So we are um, going to the next step in this forum. Uh, it's about uh, shipping. We have aligned uh, a group of uh, experts, distinguished uh, experts in the area in um, technology, finance, um, and uh, policy to an extent um, um, here in, in, uh, in this table. My name is Rene Bañares Alcantara. I'm a professor here in Oxford. I have been working on green ammonia and hydrogen production. Uh, distribution, storage, and use. And one of the uses is indeed, uh, or planned possible uses, is indeed in shipping. Um, let me uh, introduce uh, the members of the panel. Uh, the first one is Paul Stuart Smith. He's a managing partner at GA's Global Advisory. He has over 20 years' experience in business development and management roles in the shipping industry and financial markets. Uh, the second uh, person at the table is Madeid uh, McLean. Uh, she is Secretary General of the Zero Emissions Ship Technology Association, and uh, she is responsible for leading the development of zero emissions uh, tech, short and long term strategy, creating and implementing this type of uh, technology's vision and mission. The third person at the table is uh, Dominic Teague, or Teague. Uh, he's a senior sustainability analyst in LO. Um, he's a specialist in sustainable finance, and he's focused on aligning investment to the transition to a net zero, natural, positive world, and was member of uh, COP26 portfolio alignment team. And then uh, we have another participant, not at the table, right now, because he's going to connect remotely. Uh, his name is Giampiero Nacci. Um, there he is. He's director of the Green Economy and Climate Action uh, in the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Um, he has over 25 years experience in climate finance, sustainable energy, energy efficient, efficiency, circular economy, renewable energy and climate governance. And if we're lucky, we might have another member of the table, uh, Mike Mason. Uh, if he arrives, I will introduce uh, you to him. So I propose that we start with some uh, short uh, initial statements from each one of the people at the table. The order I'm proposing is first for Paul to start, and then for Matt Aid, and the third person would be um, just one second, Dominic, and lastly, Gian Piero. So, uh, Paul, if you want to start, and, and I understand you have some slides. Thank you. Thank you, Rene, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's always a pleasure to have an excuse to come back to Oxford. I read maths as, a, as an undergraduate at Corpus. Um, and since then, I've spent many years in and around the financial services. Um, the last three or four years, with a focus very much on sustainability at JS Global, um, we are focused on uh, consulting with companies on sustainability strategy, particularly decarbonisation, um, including, um, well, with an emphasis, in fact, on um, climate change disclosure aligned with the TCFD framework. Um, perhaps I should just mention here um, that some of you may know Rupert Stuart Smith. Um, he's much better known in sustainable finance circles than I am. He, I am his, his dad, in actual fact. He's part of the sustainable finance team here at Oxford. He's not here today, I believe. Um, but um, as I say, far better known than I am in sustainable finance circles, um, not least for his work on the glacier, which is at the heart of the court case being brought by the Peruvian farmer, uh, Mr. Liua against German power company RWE, um, and which is getting a lot of attention in the media um, at the moment. Uh, having said that, um, I do know something about sustainable finance um, and uh, also about shipping in actual fact. So before um, starting up uh, JS Global a few years ago, I spent eight years at the Baltic Exchange, 
um, which as where I ran its uh, regulated subsidiary. And as, as you may know, the Baltic Exchange is one of the organizations at the heart of the global maritime industry. It traces its origins back to the coffee houses of the city of London of the 18th century, um, similar sort of background to Lloyd's of London and the London Stock Exchange. And for more than two centuries, it was the place where ship owners and cargo interests and brokers and other uh, shipping interests used to meet to exchange market news and also to fix their ships, um, agree the contracts for the transportation of goods. Um, over the last 30 years or so, that, that, that role has sort of dwindled as, as people have moved into offices and the industries become far more global. Um, and the Baltic's now best known for it uh, as a data provider, specifically for the indices and the assessments that it produces on a daily basis, which give a measure of the cost of shipping across different sectors of the industry, particularly dry bulk, wet bulk, or oil tankers, and oil product tankers, and containers. And it's best known for the Baltic Dry Index, the BDI, which many see as a leading indicator of the, of the global economy, and to the extent that it is a measure of the demand for commodities such as iron ore, coal, and grain, and other dry bulk commodities, including sugar, fertilizer, and so on, um, it can be seen as a, as a leading indicator. I'll touch on the Baltic indices again briefly in a, in a few minutes, but what I'm going to try and do in these next few minutes is to start to answer this question, where are we in shipping's net zero transition? And uh, I know that my colleagues on the panel will then no doubt fill in a lot more detail about um, where we are. And that, oh, actually, I can do this. Okay, so this is where I hope we are. Um, and to, uh, or to be more specific, uh, precise, um, in terms of the, the analogy with the sneeze, I hope we're at the point where things are going to get explosive. Or to put it in the more, um, um, well, the more specific terms that um, Professor Dornbush used in this well-known quote, uh, we've been waiting for long enough for things to happen, so I'm hoping that we're now at the point where things are going to happen faster than you thought they could. And we heard um, um, Claire Perry uh, at the end of the last panel talk about the fact that some of the timetable that we seem to be wanting to achieve now for, to get to net zero is becoming rather short, and I, I'm afraid I have to agree with that. At the same time, once things start to happen, industry, when industry tra industrial changes start to happen, they can happen a lot more quickly than, than one might expect. So, is shipping's decarbonisation set to accelerate? And there are some hopeful signs, and I'm going to try and present the, um, the hopeful signs, and um, you may hear some comment from other people on the panel or in the audience about the fact that actually there's still a long way to go, which is, which is true. So I wouldn't want to paint too, too, too rosy a picture. But in any case, the International Maritime Organization is the rule-setting body for the global shipping industry. It's a branch of the United Nations. It's based just across the other side of Lambeth Bridge in, in Battersea. Um, and the IMO set its, or adopted its greenhouse gas strategy um, in 2018. And that was in part to fill a gap in the Paris Agreement, because the Paris Agreement makes no mention of shipping decarbonisation. So the IMO um, and its members, which is 175 states from around the world, um, took it on itself to adopt a greenhouse gas, gas strategy. And it wasn't really a strategy, to be honest, in the first instance. It was more a set of targets. And there are three main targets. Two to do with carbon intensity reductions, 40% by 2030, 70% by 2050, and an absolute target reduction of 50% of, of um, emissions from the industry, also by 2050. Now, over the last two or three years, the IMO has come in for a lot of criticism, and has been under pressure to ramp up the level of ambition of that target. And in actual fact, at its recent meeting, MEPC, MEPC 78, the 78th meeting of the Marine Environmental Protection Committee, which is the committee of the whole of the UN which looks at these things, there was an extensive exchange of views on a scheduled revision to that target to make it 100% reduction by 2050, or in other words, a net zero target. Now, at this point, it's just a discussion, but at next year's MEPC, number 80, there will be an MEPC 79 in the meantime, but because of the way the IMO works, not probably not that much is going to happen at MEPC 79, but at MEPC 80 next July, it is, they're going to make a decision. I was going to say it's to be hoped that they're going to make the decision to implement the 100% target. I think that the way that um, 
the discussions going right now, there's a good chance that they actually will adopt that. Of course, it'll still be a target, but at least it's a more ambitious target and aligned with the need to get to net zero. In the meantime, though, the IMO has also been working on the rules that need, it needs to implement or that need to be implemented to achieve its existing goals. So, and again, at MEPC 78, um, a couple of months ago, there was some significant pro progress on a number of these. And you'll see on the left-hand side of this slide, and this is courtesy of Classification Society, DNV, by the way, um, three, um, three items in particular I'd like to highlight. The EEXI, the Energy Efficiency Index on Existing Ships, which is a sort of technical baseline for the, for, for the efficient energy efficiency that existing ships need to achieve. And that is now going to be implemented with effect from the beginning of next year. Um, so there was agreement on that. There was also agreement on the CII, the Carbon Intensity Indicator, again to kick in from the beginning of next year. And that will set a, uh, or set a standard for, for carbon intensity that ships need to achieve on an annual basis and they're going to have to improve their, the um, intensity of their, their emissions um, on an annual basis thereafter um, in order to be... Um, allowed to continue in business, frankly. Um, ships that don't achieve a, a rating of um, A, B, or C, and it's, there's a scale of A, B, C, D, E, ships that don't achieve a rating of A, B, A or B, actually, um, are going to have to take remedial action or get rid of the ship. Okay, you get three chances. If you get, if you get a C, you get three chances to rectify things, but otherwise, you need to, you need to um, stop using that vessel. Um, and the third thing is the SIMP3 there in the middle, which stands for Ship Energy Efficiency Management Plan. And this is something that all ships are, uh, need to have on board, which explains how they are in working to improve their efficiency, essentially. So decisions were actually made on those three items at, at MEPC 78. And two other things were discussed. The second from the top, the uh, Greenhouse Gas Fuel Standard, is a newish initiative from the IMO where they're talking about the life cycle emissions of fuel and this is of course very important because there's a lot of um of um momentum behind the idea that lng can be a transition fuel i mean for the, that's true for the whole economy but it's certainly true for shipping but lng if you measure it on a life cycle basis from the well to the wake as they say it's not necessarily that much better than using heavy fuel oil if at all because you only need a small amount of methane slip or methane emissions in order to actually make methane just as bad as any other fossil fuel. The other thing that was discussed at the top there was the idea of introducing a carbon price on shipping. And this, this four proposals were discussed, and this discussion is now moving forward. Again, there may, will hopefully be a decision on that next year at MEPC 80, and that will be a significant game changer, assuming that the IMO agrees to a sufficiently high level of carbon price, and they're talking about $100 a ton of CO2 at the moment. Um, in practice, it needs to get become more than that um, to achieve its goal of making alternative fuels economically viable relative to um, heavy fuel oil. But things are starting to move. The other big player, of course, in the regulatory space is the European Union. I won't say too much about that, but except perhaps to highlight the fact that shipping is now going to be included in the European Union's um, emissions trading system. Um, there has been some chopping and changing on that recently, where it was sort of delayed on the one hand, because it was supposed to be starting to be introduced in 2023, it's now only going to be introduced in 2024. But whereas before it was going to be introduced gradually, it's now going to be introduced um, in its entirety, if you like, in 2024, assuming that this is all you know, approved at the various other stages of the legislative process. Okay, enough about that. Um, so, two more slides. I, I want to highlight um, a couple of things that are starting to happen in the, in the industry. Um, so, the first thing to highlight here is the fact that, uh, and I said I'd mention the Baltic Exchange again, and there is a, a headline from one of the shipping papers, uh, Trade Winds, another all-time low Baltic Exchange VLCC earnings plunged to record, record low. Um, and the VLCCs, as you may know, are essentially the largest type of oil tanker, uh, very large crude carriers. They transport about 2 million barrels of oil um, at a time. And 
whilst we've heard a lot about how shipping rates and container rates in particular are very, have been very high over the last couple of years because of supply chain issues, because of the pandemic, VLCC rates have actually been zero or negative over the past 18 months. And I've just got a quote there from a, a friend of mine, actually, Mark Williams, who's a well-known shipping analyst, and we also run a um, course together at the Lloyds Maritime Academy on ESG and shipping. But um, as he wrote there, the, the um, VLCC rates fell from minus $26,000 a day to minus $31,681 a day in June, which means that ship owners, after paying for operating expenses and fuel, are losing $31,000 a day on owning or, and, and, and operating a VLCC. And that ties in with this other headline, which refers to the fact that for the first time in, since the VLCC was invented back in the 1960s, the first half of 2022, so no new orders for VLCCs. Um, and similarly, on the dry bulk side, um, orders for the largest um, dry bulk vessels, cape size vessels, which transport about 170, 180,000 tons of, of commodities at a time, are at also at almost a record low. Now, in the case of VLCCs, that could be partly a function of the fact that rates are currently so low, but it may also be a, fa a, a, a function of the fact that ship owners are reluctant to spend $130 million on a new VLCC with a lifespan of 10, 20, 30, 40 years when they don't know if it's going to be needed or they can't be confident that it's going to be needed because we are, in fact, reaching peak oil. Whoops. Okay, so in terms of VLCCs, perhaps we're moving, uh, uh, perhaps going, we're going to be seeing fewer VLCCs. Um, on the other side, on the other side, or the flip side, if you like, what new developments are we seeing? And there's lots of things I could point to here. I know that Maddie's going to be talking about some of those. We could talk about the fact that uh, MERS, for example, has 16 methanol fuel ships on order, about the fact that um, Altogether, in the, order, the new order book, there are 175 ships ordered this year with dual fuel technology, so, which probably means LNG in, in many cases. But, um, but there are also lots of other things happening. And one of the most important things that I think needs to happen in order to facilitate the net zero transition for shipping is the development of landside infrastructure so that ships can refuel um, obviously at ports, as they already do, but specifically using electricity to recharge batteries, and to also, but also to take on new fuels like hydrogen. And a new report which came out recently, you see the reference to it there from March, um, highlighted the fact that what needs to happen is for, for ports, um, for port infrastructure to be part of a broader industrial hub. Okay, it's no use just trying to set up um, ports for, or to think about shipping in, in isolation. It needs to be part of a broader um, industrial hub, and perhaps we'll talk more about that in the, in the panel. Um, Rotterdam is an example where there is a huge effort to make a, develop a circular economy um, hub involving hydrogen, involving um, all, all sorts of things, but perhaps we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Okay, um, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, we see the first steps you know, happening, this is very interesting. Um, Meta is going to be talking about different technologies. Hydrogen and electricity were mentioned already, but there are other possibilities. Thank you, and thanks for setting me up so well, Paul. I can, I can, be, I can be brief. Um, if I click next, is it, will it go to my first slide? Can you bring up my, oops, no, that's got me to my second slide. So yeah, I'm the Secretary General and founder of the Zero Emission Ship Technology Association. This is an association that uh, represents um, uh, shipping primarily OEMs of technology that is zero emissions at point of use on a vessel with minimal upstream impacts. When I say minimal upstream impacts, we're not including the materials, it's, it's the technology it, it itself. Um, it, within, this, um, within this organization, it's actually, I'm not going to go into the tech because I'll talk about that later, but I will define zero. For us, zero is uh, it's, a, it's a mathematical exactitude. It is not um, an equation or an opinion. So we stick with true zero because it's a, it's, a, it's a point that's easier to defend. It's an exact spot, exact place. And for us, the only fuels that are true zero are wind, 
um, true, true zero on a full life cycle uh, analysis, um, the, in the wind in, as well as being free, um, and uh, uh, green electrons, so um, electricity produced with renewable energy, and then hydrogen produced from those green electrons. So those are the only fuels that we would consider zero. So I want to show you this slide. I'm not going to go into the detail because um, that would take too long. But th this slide, a couple of remarkable things about it. One is, so this lists all the technologies um, that, are, that are market ready, that are available now, and all the technologies that are required to have a fully zero emission vessel. Um, and you'll see on the, over here on the tech, TRL, that means technology readiness level. Um, the, TRLs are all eight or nine. So nine means it's, you know, not only is it market, it's proliferated into the market. It's into the market. And eight means that it's, it, it's, it's, it's market ready, it's market available, but hasn't achieved proliferation yet. So you can see all of these technologies, um, yeah, they're, 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 they're ready. They're now, they're on the market. Um, the significant thing about this slide is it's actually four years old. Right? So I've been presenting this for some time now, and people are only starting to, I guess, could I say, believe me, um, take it seriously? I don't know. Um, <clears throat> so, and this leads me to my next point. And that is that we cannot solve this problem with the same thinking that created the problem. So we, we need a shift in thinking, a shift in the way we approach the problems. Um, so I'm just going to talk a bit about, um, first, very quickly about the technologies. Um, so energy storage systems, this is the, this is the green electron. This is, um, these are marine batteries. Um, marine batteries are now available containerized. We are, instead of coming into a port and, you know, waiting forever to charge your batteries, they can be swapped out. So this is, this is a big, this is a, this is a current technology. This is happening now as we speak. Containerized batteries are getting swapped uh, in, and, um, in and out of vessels, meaning that um, the, the, the idea of, um, there used to be a rule of thumb that if, if you were spent um, four times longer at sea than at port, you know, you automatically switch to hydrogen. This is starting to change with the fact that um, the, the charging time is no longer an issue with marinized batteries. So, so I know these are, just, these are just drawings, but these are actually real systems that, that, that exist. Um, the other, again, oh, so yeah, I just want to go back. And so the, we can get up to 10, 20 megawatt hours of, um, of battery uh, on, on a vessel. Um, so hydrogen fuel cell systems, um, again, we can get up to 20, 20 megawatts with the current technology. Uh, the, these, these are um, images of technology that is currently um, installed on vessels, right? This isn't, this isn't science fiction. This is, um, uh, the, the li this was a, a liquid hydrogen system that goes, um, oh, can I do a laser thing? Ooh. Is that working? Am I getting a dot? No. Anyway, it goes from up there. So it's a bunker station. That's where we bring the hydrogen into the, the liquid hydrogen onto the vessel. It comes into uh, the storage tank. Um, and then in, in this, ta what the tank connection space is where the, the liquid hydrogen um, becomes gasified to uh, then be consumed by uh, the hydrogen fuel cell. So yeah, this this system it it it's exists. It's 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 been installed on on vessels. So um, yeah, not science fiction. Um, again, wind propulsion technology. There's loads of wind propulsion technologies. There'd be teeny tiny pictures on this screen if I showed you all of them. Um, these three uh, happen to be, I would say, probably the most. Um, well, the best examples of the different types that exist and that are, as I say, in the market. In the market, the, uh, the air seas kite, um, the, which, air seas kite, um, these, this, this here, this uh, Afromax um, has flattened rotors on it, and here the Frisian Sea has uh, um, uh, uh, suction wind, wind sails. Um, these, yeah, so as I say, in the market, they're on ships, you know, you can order them today. 
Um, now I'm going to talk briefly about true zero emission vessels. So again, the design, I've told you the technology exists, so now let's look at some of the designs. So this is a, a 5,000 TEU container vessel, and this is where I'm going to tell you, you need to write, we need to start changing the way we think of things. You know, this, this is a completely different, so to, to achieve true zero emission, we need to completely rip out and re-knit the, you know, vessel design. So this is, um, it's a, uh, it's a multi-hull, wind propulsion vessel, so it's, it's got a wide, um, uh, it's got a very wide breadth to handle the, 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 um, uh, the leeward uh, push uh, against uh, um, the, the wind propulsion technology. Um, so, it, and it also is maximizing the cargo space. But again, the, the, the all of the, you know, I, I I'm, I'm just going to, I will encourage all of you to go and look at our website because there's presentations on everything that I'm talking about. There's full presentations actually available on the website, so you can do deep dives on it. So I'm not going to do that here because you can do that then. So yes, the containerized battery systems, as we saw earlier, exist for this vessel. The hydrogen fuel cell um, technology exists for this vessel. All the technology this vessel requires or is already uh, in existence. Um, here's another, again, all the tech exists for this. This is a high-speed cargo uh, ship that will, is designed to compete with air freight. It carries about 20 TEU, um, uh, that's 20-foot containers, um, and it carries about the same amount of um, cargo as a Boeing um, 747, but it, it, these guys, their business cases, they can deliver at a third the cost within the same amount of time, but true zero emission. So any route that's under... Uh, 1,500 um, nautical miles they can deliver. They can also bring this vessel into, because it's a small vessel, they can bring it way, you know, in, into cities, into more interior ports and into um, underused small ports that aren't being used by these massive cargo vessels. So this is a whole different, you know, this is um, a whole different actually creating a new sector in shipping. And now we're going to jump way out of the box. Um, this is a vessel that produces hydrogen at sea. So the big thing that's holding up shipping now is actually the, um, from uh, achieving true zero is access to a true zero fuel. The thing that's holding up hydrogen production is the cost of those electrons, right? It's the production of hydrogen is, is the cost of the production of hydrogen is primarily, it's like 90% of it, you know, give or take depending on the situation, is the, the cost of your electricity. Here, you're not paying for your electricity, you're out there at sea catching that energy in your sails, that's going into a, um, a reverse prop under the sea, that energy is producing hydrogen at sea. So the demonstrator, this exists, right? They're they're, this, this project is producing hydrogen, right? The next step is to move up to um, an industrial, uh, industrial production. We're looking at that in, in next year um, from that point we'll move up to a production class vessel beginning to produce the amount of hydrogen that shipping that you know that vessels actually require and the exciting thing about that is they're producing hydrogen where shipping needs it at sea um, and the the uh, the long vision is is you know is is for, for these vessels to be producing hydrogen at sea um, everywhere you know all across the globe because there's wind everywhere so so this is, um, this, you know, as I say, the technology's there. We're, we're ready to go with this stuff. We just need, um, we can be true zero by 2040. We have the tech, we can do this. How can we do this? We can do this through systems thinking, by you know, pulling together that, uh, I'm not, I'm not gonna go do a deep dive on that, but sy systems thinking by, by looking at the problem in a holistic way and looking for and grouping solutions together um, and then taking collaborative action based on the grouping together of the solutions. So pooling, pooling resources, pooling pro projects, um, and de-risking through, um, through, the, through, the, through, the, through collaboration and, and pooling. And of course, as we all know, an effective um, regulatory mechanism. Right, thanks. <laughs> Fascinating. Thank you, Matt. Um, we now move on with uh, Dominic, uh, who is going to be talking about uh, finance uh, mainly and uh, around the 
the circle here. Do you want to use this, or it's up to you? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, ah, fantastic. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about how we apply the framework Erica introduced to the shipping industry. And re really here we're looking at answering two questions, two related questions. The first is, how do we assess how well aligned different firms in the shipping industry are to the, in the transition to net zero? And the second is, how can we identify value uh, creating opportunities within that transition? And the way that we approach both of these questions is by developing an understanding of the decarbonization pathways that are going to enable shipping to transition to, um, to net zero um, along a 1.5 um, degree aligned pathway. So, so a headline here is that shipping is already one of the lowest, the, the forms of freight transport with the lowest carbon intensities. And talking here about the grams of CO2 generated from transporting freight um, of one ton, one mile. So we're looking at a carbon intensity of about a hundredth of the footprint of air transport, for instance. But the fact that much of global trade um, travels over the oceans, we're looking at about 90% of, of global trade um, being transported um, via ships, means that actually the carbon footprint of the industry is quite substantial. So there are a range of estimates, but they generally in, in the... In, the range of around 2 to 3% of global emissions, approximately the same footprint as the aviation sector, um, can be attributed to shipping. And at the same time, we have estimates from the IEA and other institutions suggesting that uh, maritime trade could increase by as much as 150% between now and 2050. So without rapid improvements to uh, the carbon efficiency of ships, um, we're going to see uh, shipping comprising an increasingly large proportion of global emissions. So we've built out our um, house view, our internal pathway, by looking at a range of uh, different estimates from industry research and international organizations, such as the Getting to Zero Coalition, IRENA Shipping Energy Estimates, um, the Energy Transition Commission, and, and others. And in our assessment, there are really two phases that we should be thinking about in the, in the transition to uh, net zero for shipping. The first is the energy efficiency um, phase, which is going to uh, take us to 2030 and, and beyond. And here we're looking at some of the in innovations that Mada was uh, talking about in ship design, hull optimization, optimizing the, the speed of voyages to... Um, minimize the use of fuel, putting sails on, on, on ships is one idea, um, air lubrication to reduce the friction of vessels um, as they pass through, through the waters. But this, is, this alone is unlikely to get us to, well, it won't get us to, to zero. Um, the estimates we've seen out there are that we can achieve about a halving of, of the carbon intensity through the use of energy efficiency measures in the next 10 years. But to get us the full way the full, uh, uh, the full way to the end of the journey to uh, net zero, we need to be looking at zero emitting fuels. And this is going to play a particularly um, large role beyond 2030 by switching to hydrogen, ammonia, or battery um, technologies. And one of the biggest dependencies or uncertainties that we've seen in, in our assessment um, on the decarbonization potential of different fuels is on the state of the electricity grid and how decarbonized that, um, that part of our economy has uh, reached. Electricity is needed in the production of hydrogen and, and ammonia and obviously for batteries. And at a threshold of around 150 to 200 grams um, of CO2 per kilowatt hour um, generated power, the emissions of, sw of switching to, zero, to ammonia hydrogen um, from a well to wake, so right from the start of the production to the, um, the emissions on board, might actually be greater than sticking with heavy fuel, hour, fuel, fuel oil. 
And for batteries, the threshold is closer to about 500 grams of CO2 per um, kilowatt hour of power generated. So coming on to how we've used the research that we've done on pathways to actually inform our investment decision making. Um, the first use case is for our implied temperature rise metric, which Erica introduced. And we can use um, ITR across our entire um, investment portfolio. And just to recap, it's telling us if every actor in the economy behaved at the same level of ambition as this individual company, this individual um, shipping company, what would the resulting global warming be? So at a, um, at a systematic level, at a universe-wide level, we can start to distinguish between companies that are on course to decarbonize um, in line with a net zero scenario and those which are not. Um, and to pick up on one of the points that um, Paul mentioned earlier, um, the IMO requirement for um, ships to report carbon intensity indicators from 2023 uh, could actually be a useful input into our assessment. So these, these energy efficiency grades of A to E, uh, depending on how the data is available, we could use that to actually add a further element of differentiation in our systematic assessment. So if you see at this, um, this chart here, the company um, that we're assessing is starting above the 1.5 degree um, alignment curve. And the way that we do that is by looking at indicators of carbon performance um, today. Um, and companies that have um, already uh, decarbonized or used the levers available to, to them to decarbonize, then have to de decarbonize further at a slightly slower rate than the average player in their industry. So one option going forward um, in our assessment would be to use the CII uh, indicators in order to have a better understanding of where different ship operators sit um, today in order to understand how rapidly they then need to um, decarbonize going forwards. So ITR gives us a broad understanding across our whole universe, um, but to really um, understand in depth the solution providers where there'll be value impact for uh, tilting our, our capital towards them, we need to do a more thematic um, assessment. And this is captured on the next, um, next slide. So through our work on pathways, we developed a quite detailed understanding of the value chain of shipping and the various levers that are going to get us to uh, net zero. And from that understanding of the, all the various dynamics um, in this transformation, we can then start to look for companies that have strong exposure to those particular themes that are going to enable the transition. And this is a wider part of our, our assessment that we, we call climate value impact, where we're looking at the earnings exposure of companies um, in different climate transition scenarios. I'll touch on a, on a few elements of that assessment. So one factor we need to look at is the abatement costs that are associated with um, activating different decarbonization levers. For instance, at this stage, there's a significant uh, cost for a ship operator shifting from fuel oil to hydrogen or ammonia. However, that could change quite rapidly with supportive government policies, with the carbon pricing, we talked about the EU emissions trading scheme, or there's a paper recently from, um, from the Smith School, in fact, on the use of contracts for differences in order to reduce the green premium associated with um, zero emitting fuels. Um, and then the second key element in this assessment is looking at how demand is likely to play out for particular innovations um, in different um, transition scenarios. So, so again, that can inform our understanding of firms that are exposed to then those transitions. At this stage, there's a lot of uncertainty associated with exactly how demand um, dynamics are going to play out. There's a, a cons there's a growing consensus that ammonia will play a, a significant role in ship decarbonization, but I think it's fair to say, and perhaps Maddox could comment, comment um, in more detail, that there's still some debate about the exact 
um, fuel mix that we're going to, to see in the journey to 2050. So this more granular understanding of um, sh the shipping value chain and the opportunities for decarbonisation that lie within it um, can then help us to build up high conviction portfolios that give targeted exposure to the innovations that we, we need to see um, in the maritime sector. So just to sum up, our work on pathways informs our investment decision making, both in a, in a systematic um, manner through the use of implied uh, temperaturized, but also um, for high conviction uh, funds through developing this detailed understanding of the value chain and, and where um, opportunities lie within that. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, we move on to the last uh, presentation, which is from Giampiero Nacci. Um, Giampiero, as I mentioned before, is director of the Green Economy and Climate Action in the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Giampiero. Thank you very much and uh, for the invitation. Really pleased to be here with you. Uh, I think you can see my screen so I can, I can start my, uh, my intervention. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, um, uh, mention one second. Can you see? Okay. Can you see my presentation? Yes. So um, I would like to uh, uh, just uh, um, build on, uh, on the previous speakers. You know, I think uh, uh, Paul, Mata, and, and Dominic, you know, provided a great, a great sense of the direction of travel. I think I, I agree, you know, very much with their uh, their um, uh, uh, points even though i'm probably a bit more pessimistic not so much about the direction of travel but really about the speed that it will it will happen uh, because you know there are still formidable challenges ahead however i will try maybe to give a couple of points that may provide some some hope uh, just to uh, complement their their introduction and their interventions with you know some additional uh, context-related uh, uh, information. You know, the shipping industry, and in large, you know, emits roughly, give it or take, you know, one billion, one gigatons of uh, CO2 equivalent per annum, which is roughly 2.5 percent of energy-related, you know, carbon emissions globally. Uh, uh, and the, the point, you know, while indeed, as Dominic was mentioning, you know, it, it remains, you know, a relatively low-carbon transport mode. But the problem is that the share of these emissions. Are, are, are growing, are projected to grow, not only because of the you know, growth in, the, in, in commerce and traffic, but also because you know, the industry uh, 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 lags behind perhaps other sectors in terms of you know, accelerating the decarbonization uh, uh, um, investments. Uh, this is due to a variety of, uh, of, of uh, situations and, and issues, and I will you know, touch upon some of them in the, in the, uh, in the next slide. But there is also an intrinsic, you know, inertia of the industry typically that you know tend to to operate with through incremental changes rather, rather than the uh, uh, radical shift and step changes that let's say also Mada uh, mentioned a few minutes ago. Uh, uh, continuing on the context uh, uh, setting, uh, the investments to uh, uh, decarbonize the industry, you know, there are various. Uh, projections and estimates, you know, but they range between, you know, 1 trillion up to 2050 to, you know, around 2 trillion, depending on, you know, whether we, we utilize the current IMO uh, greenhouse gas emission target or whether we look into uh, 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 the uh, uh, full decarbonization of the sector. But, you know, we're talking about a very substantial set of investments uh, that, let's say, uh, uh, needs to be mobilized uh, 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 as quickly as possible uh, uh, to accelerate the transition. Now, one of the problems that I, I think I, I, can, I can mention here is that the um, decarbonization of the sector you know, goes through a number of shifts that affects or, let's say, involve a number of you know, systems which are connected, but are not necessarily uh, operating in full synchronization. And here there are, you know, again, you, you can uh, 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 aggregate, if you like, the systems in different ways, but, you know, in terms of the transformation, you know, clearly there is a need to uh, decarbonize the fuels. Uh, I will not go to the details as been mentioned by uh, uh, the previous speakers, uh, but I want just to mention one point there, that the uh, 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 zero fuel, the renewable fuels that needs to be produced for the sector, they're also, uh, in fact, 
uh, um, uh, supporting transformation in other sectors. So there is an element of competition. Ammonia, for example, when it comes to fertilizers, uh, and hydrogen in general for decarbonizing uh, uh, hard to abate sector like steel and cement. Um, uh, I, I think uh, Paul mentioned, you know, of course, the infrastructure, the, the requirements to you know develop the infrastructure system. This is a major challenge, not only because of the capital intensity and the uh, and the complexity to uh, uh, develop a new uh, fuel distribution system, but also because these these uh, 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 investments need to to take place while, of course, there is a parallel uh, a system that, let's say, supply uh, the, the industry, the shipping uh, industry uh, uh, via the you know, conventional fossil fuel uh, uh, um, uh, sort of uh, systems. Uh, then the third, the third uh, area, which is probably the most complex to address, is, of course, the uh, upgrade of the fleet. And, uh, and, the, and, and I think the problem here is the cyclicality of the industry and the high capex uh, in a sector that, let's say, uh, 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 traditionally is low to, to uh, update. Uh, but also, again, the problem here is not the actual trial, but the, the speed and the, uh, and, and the type of technology choices uh, that the investors need to make. And finally, another system which is very important is the integration, the intelligent transport system, the digitalization. Clearly, without uh, a full integration of logistic systems, without you know, investments in digitalization, uh, uh, will be difficult to uh, uh, optimize the uh, benefits associated to the low carbon transition. I, I would also like to uh, include, or let's say, mention another uh, element of, if you like, uh, uh, um, asymmetry, because you know we see interesting developments taking place, both on, from the technology perspective, but also from the infrastructure development uh, perspective, in advanced economies. You know, uh, uh, Paul mentioned Port of Rotterdam, that is really moving towards becoming a major hub. For uh, renewable uh, fuels, uh, likewise, I think you've you know read on the news uh, the the major developments in uh, in Singapore. But the reality is that you know these developments tend to happen uh, at you know different pace in uh, in uh, the developing countries in the emerging economies. Actually, most of the growth on the traffic is expected to come. So this is a, this is a, 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 an asymmetry that of course uh, uh, makes the problem more uh, more complicated to address. Even though we see some signs of of you know interesting developments coming up you know again looking at EBRD uh, region you know we see interesting developments for example in connection to the Suez Canal uh, economic zone where you know there is a, there is an aspiration to become a hub for uh, for green hydrogen now going back to the uh, uh, um, the sort of drivers you know again uh, 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 some of these points have been touched upon already so I will not repeat but I would like to add a couple of uh, elements here. So uh, uh, clearly, the world merchant fleet is, you know, quite aged, you know, uh, uh, and uh, and this can be an, a, an opportunity uh, to rebuild, you know, a greener uh, uh, um, uh, sort of uh, fleet. But at the same time, Paul highlighted some of the issues associated to parts of the industry, segments of the industry, which, you know, uh, uh, struggle to find the economic incentives to accelerate the upgrade. Um, Maybe uh, 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 remaining on uh, on the uh, uh, kind of uh, drivers and the opportunities, I'd like to mention three points, which actually are not on this slide, but I think are important to uh, uh, and in my view could provide uh, some you know uh, positive signs of of hope. One is the, uh, consumer demand. You know, I think we all uh, observe an increasing uh, uh, pressure from uh, different segments of consumers. In, in asking for you know, low carbon, zero carbon products. And we see signs across the production systems about companies, organizations that are moving in that direction. So the, 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 that sign I think is a, is a, could be a very important driver. The second comes from the financial sector itself. Uh, uh, you probably are aware with you know, Glasgow uh, uh, Financial uh, Alliance for Net Zero, all the initiative associated to decarbonizing you know, uh, financial assets. Clearly, I work in a bank. For us, you know, whenever we look at new investments and a new, a new uh, financial assets, we really, you know, start looking at the implications in the in the short, medium, and long term. At DBRD, for example, we have a a, a, a Paris alignment, full Paris alignment uh, commitment by the end of 2022, which means it would be very difficult for us, if not impossible, to finance investments which are not really contributing contributing to the decarbonization. Um, 
And, and finally, the third point, uh, Paul mentioned the IMO uh, uh, aspiration or plan to introduce a carbon pricing. Clearly, uh, if that happens, uh, that could be a, a significant source of funding, which uh, if properly utilized, can, can really may, uh, uh, contribute significantly to uh, uh, um, accelerate the decarbonization of the industry. Now, going back to some of the challenges that we see, you know, I think I'm stating the obvious here, but it's, it's worthwhile anyway repeating some of these points. You know, we have, of course, the issue of the first movers, uh, uh, Paul mentioned and Mada mentioned, of course, you know, new interest in developments, but still uh, 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 the uh, uh, incentive to, uh, in, in a very competitive and very, um, you know, uh, low margin industry, uh, the issue of the first movers remain, remains a problem. Uh, the financial instruments and large are not really designed or are not necessarily fit for purpose to support the rapid transition. I'll give you one example, you know, to finance a, a green hydrogen or a green ammonia uh, uh, infrastructure, you know, uh, from, from a banking perspective, you really need uh, uh, long term of take agreements, uh, which are not available at the moment. So there is there is a barrier in in uh, uh, structuring financial products. That you know provide finance at scale, but also with the with the right pricing. There is an issue of capacity across the sectors because okay, we mentioned mask, we mentioned some of the big developers, but the reality is that many ships are relatively small, and you know they tend to struggle in uh, 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 dealing with uh, with technology innovation and uh, and uh, you know uh, uh, introducing new technologies. And finally, the the uh, uh, you know well studied issues of the split in, split incentive risk between owner and uh, and operators uh, i'd like to close with uh, Jean, you know, perhaps men mentioning if yeah uh, could you wrap up in a minute or two so we have some questions yeah yeah, yeah. I, i'll Thank wrap you. up immediately so i would just to say that in our view uh, uh, clearly talking about uh, a cyclical industry where you know these investments remain capital intensive uh, it's important that let's say uh, strategies are are designed to uh, 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 maximize short-term benefits uh, uh, while also avoiding uh, investment in assets which will become stranded uh, 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 relatively soon. So we think, and again, this is, a, this is a, something that uh, investors and financiers uh, can, uh, can apply. You know, we need to make sure that, let's say, investments in the short term uh, are really already uh, uh, moving towards uh, decarbonization using existing cost-competitive technologies. But then critical remains the investments in the infrastructure. So in our view, this is what really will, uh, will, uh, will be a game changer if the infrastructure for uh, renewable fuels uh, uh, become available earlier. I will stop it here and, and of course, you know, happy to continue the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Giampiero. So we have um, just over 15 minutes for questions. I have many, but definitely we should start with the public. So we have... Uh, uh, question here. Um, the, yes, if you can bring the microphone, please. Uh, there. Thank you. Is this working? Yeah. Thank you, Renee. So this is a question about financial flows. Let's make this very simple. Dominique's got all the investor assets. Uh, Giovanni Pro covers all the banks. All Maru's friends have got the answers, and Paul is an observer of the system. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to highlight the bottlenecks, but our challenge is to knock them over. Mm -hmm. So where are the intervention points in the system that will accelerate the flow of finance to the shipping industry, which I look at in three phases. The panelists may have different views. There are public markets, there are private markets, there are um, private shipping owners. There are probably mm -hmm. three sort of owners of capital. Uh, and I do have to thank the panel because, as my friends know, I know nothing about the real economy. But after this panel, I shall now speak about shipping like a, a green finance analysis. So thank you for that. Maybe a second question, if, if you have, uh, there is uh, another person there, then we can discuss them. 
Hi, Erica Vanguard here from Loma Dodi. Thank you very much for uh, an interesting uh, panel. It was a couple of years ago since I covered the uh, shipping industry, but that was at the point when the sulfur cap was introduced. And I remember that uh, the retrofitting of scrubbers were a particularly complex issue. Uh, some of the vessels where it was retrofitted on actually dispersed the uh, waste at open seas. So I guess governance also come into questions when looking for green financing into uh, this industry. So those are a few, um, if you can shield some lights from that from the panel, that will be very helpful from an investor perspective. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Maybe a third question, but if not, yes, there is another person here. Thank you. Just a very quick one. You mentioned at the end of the final presentation that there might be impact um, coming through via suppliers. And I'm just wondering, is there any demand from the customers uh, whose goods are being shipped for low-carbon low shipping because as part of their whole scope three? Very interesting question. Okay. So, um, I think... I think, well, uh, at least the first question uh, actually deals with uh, integration, I suppose, and, and coordination, um, bottlenecks in this case for intervention. Um, so any of you, maybe the two people that sort of touch on this point, Dominic and Gian Piero, may want to comment on that? Yeah, sure. Um, so w one of the really interesting things that came out of COP 26 for shipping was this Clyde Bank, Clyde Bank sorry, declaration for green shipping corridors with the idea of creating um, routes between different ports where different regulatory incentives could be put in place, funding could be made available for port infrastructure in order to um, facilitate, let's say, an example of decarbonisation on, on particular routes. I think that's an perhaps a parallel to the country platforms that we, uh, Claire mentioned in the first panel. That's a nice way of creating a, an ecosystem in which funding can be um, directed. And to just unpack the point around how contracts for, for differences could be used in, that, in, in the context of a green corridor, here you could, you could use the contract for difference in order to account for the green premium that exists for the ship operator. So an effective and but quite targeted means of public subsidy towards those companies on particular routes in order to demonstrate that this can, this can work at scale. Yeah, I think that's a very good mechanism to start uh, doing this coordination. Otherwise, we have this chicken and egg situation. Have ships with no fuel or fuels that you cannot sell. You know, enough. So, mm. so uh, yeah, good. Um, I think a, a really good question uh, it was the last one, the demand from the customer. We have been talking about banks, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but uh, can you comment on that, uh, Paul? Uh, sure. I mean, that's actually a quite straightforward question because there is... Yeah. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> um, there is quite a lot of demand um, from customers, um, some of the big um, retail... Um, companies like IKEA is often cited in this context, for example, um, but also uh, mining companies like BHP. Um, these sorts of companies are demanding um, that their supply chains decarbonize, and shipping is seen as a, I won't say an easy target, but it's a target that uh, companies can focus on to reduce their scope three emissions. In, in the previous panel, we heard discussion of the importance of scope three emissions. Um, so shipping is coming fr under pressure from those. That's on. You okay. That was on. That's on. I speak quite loudly anyway, so maybe you heard what I said or not. Seems um, so. In any case, the answer is yes. Um, <laughs> so companies like IKEA, BHP, Billiton, they want to reduce their scope three emissions of the, the emissions from the supply chain, and shipping companies are therefore having to respond to that. Um, some of that is happening in the green corridors, which Dominic just, just referred to. So, for example, there's um, you know, one well-known um, 
shipping route called C5, which the Baltic Exchange um, um, supervises, if, if you like, um, and which is a, uh, a route which transports uh, for iron, transportation of iron ore from Australia to, to China, for example. There's a, a very clearly defined route there with a start and end point, huge amount of tonnage that goes back, well, forward from Australia to China, about a billion tons of iron ore um, makes that journey every year. Um, so those sorts of um, specific routes can be um, isolated, if you like, and, and decarbonized potentially, um, you know, and, and, and single those out from the complexity of the whole global supply chain, or what seems like the complexity of it. Okay, thank you. Can I jump in? Yes, yeah, sure. I, yes. yeah, I think um, that the two, the, the, the first and the last question are, are very closely related because um, we, we say ships, ships don't move cargo, cargo moves ships. So it really is down to the cargo owners getting behind and, 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 um, and, and pushing for this, as, as, as Paul was saying. And what we're talking about doing within the association, so just you know, some very pragmatic answers on this, is we're looking at bringing, um, pooling projects, so bringing together, say, um, uh, 10 or more ship owners together to, to just de-risk the whole situation, to, to sort of kickstart it, as, as you're saying, so that you're bringing, um, so you've got one of these routes, an A to B route, where you've got you know, uh, a group of cargo owners who are all shipping across that route, you've got ship owners who are supplying that route, um, a port on either end, and, you, and, you, and then you bring in class, you bring in um, insurance certification, because again, you've got insurers that don't want to move into this space because it's, it's risky. So, so by pooling the projects, you, you de-risk it for everyone across the sector, but also start achieving economies of scale on the very expensive technology, and as well as the fuel. And just a, a point um, is that, you know, it's, it's outside of the shipping sector, but a very important, important place for investment is going to be re renewable energy or any of the renewable projects that are actually bringing the, the green electrons into the sector. And I just wanted to comment on um, the, fi the, the question about the scrubbers. Um, yeah, I was, that was watching all of that unroll. And um, I think that I would say that a place you want to be particularly careful about is, is ammonia that I have been um, doing my own due diligence on this and, and I'm seeing that a lot of, a lot of um, there's a lack of due diligence, there's a lack of environmental impact assessment uh, around ammonia and um, this is uh, th potentially ammonia as a fuel in shipping could cause higher climate impacts than we're seeing from what we're currently using. Um, also there's, there's the toxicity issues and the liability issues around those toxicity issues, as in crews being liable for um, any uh, follow-on of, of accidents. So that would, be, that would be my answer on that question there. Okay, if I may, If I may quickly, uh, on, on the scrubber, because we looked into this uh, quite extensively in our finance, and I think what we've observed that uh, uh, most uh, uh, ship owners uh, uh, really moved uh, uh, on uh, low sulfur fuel uh, rather than selling stony scrubber. So uh, for a number of reasons, because of the capital cost, also because the differential between uh, low sulfur fuel and heavy fuel oil became quite, you know, kind of declined, quite small. So uh, that's a, the observation, at least in the markets that we serve. And on the first question, if, uh, if I may very rapidly, um, uh, I think Mada mentioned also the, the need to, to, to bring the financial sector you know, across the spectrum, the insurance companies, the financiers, the investors, the equity investors, etc. Uh, so this is absolutely critical. I just want to mention an initiative led by the IMO, which you know, the, the, the World Bank and the EBRD support is supporting, uh, which is called FinSmart, which is uh, an initiative to bring together different parties and stakeholders, the regulators, the financial sector, private, uh, commercial, but also uh, uh, public uh, uh, sector related with the project developers and with uh, the um, uh, uh, the ship owners and operators. So the idea is really to identify uh, using the IMO convening power, you know, really to identify synergies across all the actors and identify pilot projects that, you know, we uh, 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 could be financed to accelerate, particularly when it comes to, not exclusive, of course, but particularly when it comes to the infrastructure, 
uh, again, in order to accelerate the transformation in, uh, in some of the key markets. Thank you. Yes, I think one very interesting point, and I'll uh, let you do your question, but, but it's, you know, we're introducing new technologies. We do need to have this due diligence uh, operation. For example, natural gas, we know it's methane. Methane is, you know, very much a greenhouse gas. If even a small amount escapes, you know, there is a problem. And as far as I know, some of the projects, the majority of the carbon capture and storage projects now, done or paid by oil industries, are using the CO2 to push in secondary oil recovery more oil to be burnt. You know, obviously this is not going to be sustainable. I'm not saying that's the only way to do it, but we need to be careful about, you know, uh, these labels, blue hydrogen, for example, maybe actually much worse than brown. But anyway, there is another question uh, at the top. Uh, hi, yeah, Th thanks, this is, this is fascinating. Um, and just, just wanted to contrast two approaches to decarbonizing a transport sector. So in California, they're decarbonizing transport, land transport, with a low carbon fuel standard approach. And in the UK, we're decarbonizing transport in effect by sort of banning vehicles that use fossil fuels. So most of the conversation here has been about the UK sort of approach, in effect working out how we can drive ships without fossil fuels. Has anybody thought about the California approach, low carbon fuel standard for shipping? Anyone? Yeah. I, I am well. Just to clarify what I mean is, well, what, the way it works in California is you progressively reduce the carbon intensity of the fuels that are being sold that are put into California's vehicles mm -hmm. by either virtually decarbonizing them by getting rid of the CO2 somewhere else or by using lower carbon inputs. I think that's, in, in the IMO, that's being regulated through the, um, the car yeah. carbon intensity indicator. So it's, it's, not, it's not removing the carbon from the fuels itself, but it's reducing the amount of emission, amount, amount a ship can e emit. I think it's, it's more challenging, because it's a global sector, it would be very hard to just focus specifically on reduction of carbon in, uh, in the fuel itself, although it's an interesting concept. I mean, there, there is the possibility of hydrogen can be used as a drop in fuel up to 20% in any engine. So that, that would be one way of, of, of going about it, is actually bringing hydrogen in. But a, another challenge in, in shipping is the, um, is the, it's the kit, it's the tech, it's the, it's the you know, if you, you, you know, the, a marine engine sometimes won't even like to, to bunker, it won't, it won't like um, even, even the same fuel if it's coming from a different source. So, um, so it, it would, you know, given the size of the sector, I think that would be very challenging to, to have um, different types of fuels going into the same technology. Mm. Same in there is a question there. Uh, super interesting panel, thank you. Uh, I mean, shipping is such an obvious target for decarbonization. Clearly, it's complex, but, but it also appears to have just sort of dragged its feet more than most sectors as well because uh, we've known lots of this for a really long time. So I, I have a couple of questions. The, the, the voluntary approaches, the coalition, some of the clustering you're talking about, really interesting, but, but yeah, also there are limits to sort of how fast that's, that's, that's really going to work and how it's really going to bite. So is the IMO regulation, is that binding? Are there financial or legal penalties that apply to the, the, the companies that then aren't doing that? And is that really a reason for hope and for transformation in the way that you're outlining? Um, and then I, I had a question on whether China, uh, which we haven't talked much about, you know, how is China engaging in this? Because I, I can imagine just quite what a large percentage of global trade is now through China and the China's maritime kind of uh, requirements. So just any thoughts on the role of China in, in this broader conversation? Thank you. I can take, yeah, I can take, certainly take the first part of that yeah. in terms of the way the IMO process works. Um, I mean, the IMO is not in the business of fining um, shipping companies. 
Um, the IMO acts, um, first of all, by consensus, generally speaking, between its members, which are the member states. Um, and then it's up to the member states um, to uh, enshrine the, whatever has been decided at the IMO in its own domestic legislation. Um, and then it, but then it's also up to the flag states, um, and as you probably know, all, all ships are, are flagged to a particular state, for them to um, make sure that the, um, the rules are implemented properly in the ships that are, are registered under their flag. Um, so that's how, how that would work. Um, so it's not, it's not a voluntary pro It wouldn't be voluntary at that point. It would be you know, implemented and, and regulated. Um, of course, the problem with the IMO is that it, because it does operate by consensus, it is a multilateral um, diplomatic endeavour, um, and that's messy, takes time. Um, and so, you know, do we have enough time for the IMO to go through all the phases of, it, of it, uh, adopting the, the relevant rules? Um, as I try to indicate, things seem to be speeding up a little bit. Is that going to be enough? Quite possibly not. Um, Market-based measures, um, or carbon tax, introduced by the IMO probably won't be implemented, even with the best will in the world, before, much before the end of, the, end of this decade. Um, which is why the fact that the EU is moving ahead is probably very, very useful um, in order to drive that. Um, I also think, by the way, coming back to your question on to, in terms of financing, that the carbon price is a critical um, element in terms of driving uh, investment into alternative fuels and alternative types of ships, because um, without it, those, you know, those investments are, are far from certain because those ships may not be commercially viable. But the fact is that some companies like Merce, for example, are putting the money, where, the money where the mouth is and are investing in those types of ships. And it's not just Merce, there's quite a number of others. So it is starting to happen. And they're doing that on the basis that they believe, or at least I think this is what they're doing, on the basis that they believe that change is coming and that a carbon price in particular is coming, which is going to make it commercial, commercially um, viable to operate a methanol fuel ship, biomethanol, of course, rather than you know, fossil fuel methanol. Um, and, um, and, and particularly in the EU, of course, um, you know, there will be, or there is a, a carbon price that will apply to shipping, and that will make those ships commercially viable. And you know, once the Mersks of this world start to go down this route, then companies will want to use them, the IKEAs and the BHPs and so on, and other ships, shipping companies will have to follow suit. Okay, maybe if... If I may, uh, quickly... Uh, on uh, on the uh, IMO, uh, uh, let's say my understanding is that let's say part of the uh, greenhouse gas strategy of the IMO includes also. Uh, you're frozen, Jean Piero. If you can hear us. And Come back on the comment on China, and that's it. You know, following on Paul's comment, it it it, it the UN. They, or rather the IMO, which is a UN organization, has, I mean, they, they can take a vote, and they can, if it's 50%, they can all say, right, okay, we're going to pass this through. But it wouldn't really be effective because it has to be ratified by all of the countries, and it is port state control within those countries by the, the, the flags uh, that, that, that enforces it. So if a country is, doesn't ratify it, they're not, they're, they're not going to in, in enforce it. And... China is, is very, very much in, engaged in the process, very much engaged in the conversation, um, contributes uh, vastly um, to, 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 the, to, the converse, to the conversation. Um, some people have the impression that China is holding things up and that certain states are holding things up. But, but um, if you look at um, like their, their economic model, um, I would say at this point in time, I don't think there's, I think, I think that all countries at the IMO, and, and I attend the MEPC meetings regularly, that, that they're, they're all working in, 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 in goodwill towards, um, towards bringing, in, uh, bringing forward these initiatives. Okay, so uh, we are five minutes late for lunch, um, but um, I think we can uh, end here interesting conversations may and will happen during lunch and later on. Thank you.